I would like to show you some photographs and film coverage of what Germany looked like um, at the end of World War II after years of heavy Allied bombing that had brought destruction on every city. Most of the scenes that you'll look at now are actually photographs of Berlin immediately after the war. A few years after the war, Hannah Arendt returned to Germany for the first time with a mission to reclaim Jewish property, um, either to its rightful owners or, if that was not possible, to disperse it among Jewish communities around the world. And, uh, here's what I've written about Hannah Arendt's first visit to Germany after World War II. She flew to Paris at the end of November, writing to Heinrich Blucher from there that air travel was indescribably marvelous and that Paris was still beautiful and lively. Then, at the beginning of December, she moved on to Wiesbaden and Bonn to begin work on the reclamation of Jewish property. Her first impressions were of the gray shortness of the winter day in Germany compared to New York, which despite the differences in climate is on the same latitude as Naples, Italy, and the reluctance of the Germans to confront the past, yielding instead to the very silence Jaspers had anticipated and feared. She wrote to Heinrich, her dear snubby, that a new Jewish question seemed to reside behind every polite conversation. How many did you kill? Even though she knew the honest answer in most cases would have been none. Heinrich was right, she told him, to want never to go back. The lump of sentimentality, she wrote, that begins to rise gets stuck in one's throat. After one has spent a week here reading every newspaper all the way from right to left, one is ready to go back home. And everything is written in a tone of gloating. What's true is that everyone's against rearmament for participation in NATO and the Cold War. The newspapers express it more or less like this. You see now, you suddenly want us to become soldiers. But ha ha, now we're pacifists. Yet there's this deceptive familiarity in everything. Above all, the landscape. An indescribably wonderful reunion. Towns which one suddenly remembers because one's feet know so well which way to go. Silence about the past, about what had happened, how it had happened, who had done what, was oppressive. The proverbial elephant unspoken of in the room. Everyone knew there were Nazis among them, but no one spoke of it because it was Uncle Willie or Fritz or Kata next door, and why make trouble? Arendt sensed that Nazi political influence was gone, and that few Germans remained true believers. But she also saw that among the many new Christian and social democrats, there were quite a few who missed the good old days of Hitler's rule before the war. The Germans were too focused on the future, establishing democracy, rebuilding and improving the infrastructure and economy, salvaging what could be salvaged of a German way of being, to grieve over their own losses or the evil they had brought about. They were all living off lifelong illusions, she wrote to Heinrich, and working like mad. The towns were still in ruins, after bombings of unprecedented magnitude in the air war, but the ruins had already been swept clean. The sight of Germany's destroyed cities and the knowledge of German concentration and extermination camps have covered Europe with a cloud of melancholy, she wrote. But nowhere is this nightmare of destruction and horror less felt and less talked about than in Germany itself. Amid the ruins, Germans mail each other picture postcards still showing the cathedrals and marketplaces, the public buildings and bridges that no longer exist. And the indifference with which they walk through the rubble has its exact counterpart in the absence of mourning for the dead, or in the apathy with which they react, or rather fail to react, to the fate of the refugees in their midst. This general lack of emotion and apparent heartlessness is only the most conspicuous outward symptom of a deep-rooted, stubborn, and at times vicious refusal 
to come to terms with what really happened. Watching the Germans busily stumble through the ruins of a thousand years of their own history, shrugging their shoulders at the destroyed landmarks, or resentful when reminded of the deeds of horror that haunt the whole surrounding world, one comes to realize that busyness has become their chief defense against reality, and one wants to cry out, but this is not real. Real are the ruins. Real are the past horrors. Real are the dead whom you have forgotten. But the Germans are living ghosts, whose speech and argument, the glance of human eyes, and the mourning of human hearts no longer touch.